Hello everyone, uh, thank you for tuning in uh, for this session of questions and answers. Um, I'll be starting this session with a short presentation about uh, atrial fibrillation, which is a very important topic and I think that lots of people should know about it. Uh, and the reason is that it's a disease of the heart which is very common and it increases with age. So uh, people um, might have it uh, and might not even know about it the incidence and prevalence is quite high the for people 75 years of age and older the incidence is about 10 percent meaning that for every 10 people you take above the age of 75 one of them will have it and why do we talk about it because it has got serious complications if not uh, diagnosed and treated early uh, if i mean it's a very common disease as i said just a few days ago President Biden had a checkup and one of the things that came up that he has got atrial fibrillation. So that's how common it is, something that everyone should know. And as I said, why do we uh, talk about it and why do we, uh, uh, why would I like to talk about it? It's because of the complications uh, here. Um, the, um, it's, it's a serious disease in which uh, the heart is irregularly irregular and I will show you here like an example of what I mean about it. Instead of the heart beating regularly one beat of the other, it's completely chaotic beating as you can see here. And um, with that, it develops certain complications that I'm going to be talking uh, about here. So, um, one most of the important things about atrial fibrillation and why we need to talk about it and diagnose it and hopefully treat it is that with when the heart is irregular, it, its pumping is inefficient, and therefore uh, blood tends to stagnate in the heart. And what blood, when blood is stagnates in the heart, it forms clots, and these clots can form and go to any part of the body, blocking the circulation. Uh, most importantly, obviously, is the circulation uh, to the heart and obviously to circulate to the brain because it can go up and it can give rise to a stroke. And um, this is another schematic presentation comparing the two uh, diseases. Here on the right hand side, you can see that the heart is completely irregular, beating chaotically. And you can see here on the left hand side is the normal beating. That's how the heart should beat. So when the heart is irregular, uh, it uh, uh, can cause, uh, as I said, clots uh, to be formed in the heart, just like you're seeing here. Now the heart is pumping normally. And then, <coughs> well, we see here there's a clot coming into the left ventricle and now going up to the aorta. And then it goes up the circulation and goes to the brain, as you can see here in this uh, animation here and then it goes and lodges there and the brain infarcts and that's a stroke now this can happen uh, to different areas uh, it's not only the the brain but can happen to uh, uh, the heart for example and it can uh, give rise to a heart attack so this is one of the most serious complications and the treatment for it generally obviously is red heart rate control first and then blood thinners to try to prevent this and then trying to put the patient back to his normal rhythm. And we can talk about it in a separate session differently about treatments. It has also been shown that uh, patients do develop cognitive impairment uh, and dementia on the long term for untreated atrial fibrillation. So uh, this is obviously important. No one would like to have cognitive impairment at the age, but unfortunately this is one of the things that uh, we have to be uh, careful about. And that's why we need to, to treat this atrial fibrillation. Another thing is because the heart is beating fast and irregular, then you tend to get heart failure. The heart is not designed to be pumping at a very, very high rate. It has got some limitations about uh, how fast we are built to uh, to pump. 
So if your heart is performing at a rate in which you're running all the time, the heart will become weak and you go into heart failure. And obviously that has got serious symptoms and um, the heart will not be able to perform for long if not supported and treated. Um, also, a heart attack, if you have got coronary disease blockages and the heart all of a sudden is stressing more than it should do, then you're very likely going to go into a heart attack. So um, we don't want that. Uh, in addition, these clots I spoke to you about it can sometimes go into the coronary circulation, not only to the brain. And if it goes to the coronary circulation, it blocks the flow of blood to the muscle of the heart, and that can lead to a heart attack as well. Uh, also, studies have shown that people who have got atrial fibrillation, when compared to the normal population, they are at an increased risk of death on the long term. Uh, because of the factors that I just mentioned, when you combine all these together, then you will see that there are quite uh, a few uh, uh, causes that can lead to an increased risk here. Uh, just give me a second here. Okay. Um, now, now, how do we diagnose atrial fibrillation and how, how do we present with it? Uh, if you can just give me a second here. <coughs> so, uh, you might have atrial fibrillation and it might not be uh, really have any uh, symptoms for it. It can be paroxysmal, it can come and go. And you sometimes, some people feel it, that there is some abnormal uh, palpitations, uh, abnormal feeling in the chest, and some people don't. And sometimes it just uh, comes and goes, and we call it paroxysmal. Another term for it is persistent atrial fibrillation, which is irregular heartbeat that is there for some period of time, and then uh, it fail, uh, fails to terminate within seven days, and that's persistent atrial fibrillation. If it persists, uh, for a long period of time, then we call it like long-standing atrial fib fibrillation and uh, either persistent or permanent, depending on how we do. So this is the, an overview of atrial fibrillation and I just wanted to bring it to my audience that this is something that we all have to check for and we have to be aware of, um, especially as uh, we age, and as I said, the incidence of in people above 70 years of age is about 10%, and it's a very serious disease, and we just need to be aware of it, to be treated, to have blood sinus, to avoid strokes, to avoid dementia, and to improve our longevity. So this is uh, something I wanted to talk about uh, here uh, as a start of my presentation here. I will take some questions now, I will start answering them. And then I will, uh, depending on the amount of questions, then I can talk more about atrial fibrillation and take it from there. Okay, so let's get So this is the first question I got uh, from Sarah. Thank you, Sarah, for the question. Sarah from the USA. Does edema in the right ventricle have to be treated? Is subtle or for long-term use? Okay, uh, thank you for this question. Uh, so edema is uh, usually is a peripheral accumulation of fluid in the body. It's a manifestation of accumulation of fluid in the body and it can be in the legs and it can be in the arms so the right heart is very important in its uh, development and the reason being it's usually the back pressure and the inefficient circulation that causes edema 
Most commonly, it starts from the left side of the heart, most commonly, but it can start on the right side of the heart as well, when the right side fails. Most commonly due to an issue or another, either heart failure or you have got mitral valve disease or you have got atrial fibrillation we spoke about, the circulation becomes inefficient and there becomes accumulation of fluid in the lungs. And as the back pressure builds up, then the right side of the heart, the right ventricle, will get affected. And then it's the pressure starts to build up, and then this pressure will get transmitted backwards and will manifest as edema in the legs. So edema, obviously, is A, uncomfortable, you've got swelling in your legs, and B, as I mentioned, most commonly due to manifestation of the left side of the heart. So there will also be fluid accumulation in the lungs. And that will cause severe shortness of breath here. So um, this shortness of breath will not be able, you will not be able, to, or the person will not be able to be very much uh, functioning normally uh, without it being treated. Therefore, it will need to be treated. And most commonly, it is by diuretics. Um, diuretics are the treatment in order to get rid of the fluid uh, from uh, from the legs and from from the lungs as well. So yes, it needs it needs to be treated. Uh, this accumulation of fluid. Uh, in addition, you ask your question here. Um, you said, "Is satellite safe for long-term use?" So satellite usually before we start it, we admit the person to the uh, hospital and we start it for a couple of days and we try to do EKG uh, measurements to make sure that it is safe. So if you have been admitted and this EKG did not manifest with any significant EKG changes which can manifest in arrhythmia, then it's generally safe and we just keep an eye of it. Now, you mentioned Satellol. Satellol is one of the common medications that we use for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So I wonder whether uh, you are referring to someone who has got atrial fibrillation that comes and goes and that you are, uh, and that person is being treated uh, with, uh, with for Satellol. Because this is the commonest indication for use of Satellol is paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, just like what I mentioned in my introduction. So for the long term, uh, yes, provided that it is being looked at and monitored appropriately and properly uh, by your physician or by the patient's physician, it should be fine. Just want to say one uh, thing, uh, Sarah, and if you have got uh, any further follow-up question, please type it before I go to the next question, uh, is that um, you said the right ventricle. Uh, sometimes it's purely a right ventricular issue. Uh, in people who have got like primary pulmonary hypertension or disease of the right ventricle, primarily disease of the right ventricle, it can be purely a right-sided issue and still, it, yes, it needs to be treated. So I hope this answers your question and if you have got a follow-up question to that, I would be very happy to answer it. Okay, I see. So Sarah here added and I'll put the uh, question she followed up and she said ventricular tachycardia uh, okay so ventricular tachycardia so you have got left-sided or the patient that you're talking about has got a left-sided issue uh, in the heart so uh, that will bring back to the point that most commonly is a left-sided issue so that's you have got the left side of the heart and let me just explain here a bit So this is the left ventricle here, and this is the right side of the heart here. So uh, what I was talking about is that the pressure building in on the left and going back and affecting the right side of the heart, and then you get this swelling. So for ventricular tachycardia, which is affecting mainly the, the left side of the heart, um, it's a back built of pressure. Yes, you can use the satellol uh, for it. Um, ventricular tachycardia is a, uh, is a serious condition and probably you are 
depending on what sort of tachycardia you had, whether it's just a mild one and whether there are other factors that we also need to take into consideration for ventricular tachycardia. And that is what is your heart or the patient's heart function like? If the heart function is strong, meaning at least ejection fraction above 40 to 45%, then we can treat with medications only. If the heart is weak, 35% or less ejection fraction, then we have to consider, in addition to medication, other alternatives. And the other alternatives is basically, uh, our additional treatment is an implantable ICD, an implantable cardiovascular defibrillator. So this is the other treatment that we have to add if the heart function is low. So, um, if the heart function is good, um, then the risk of developing significant hemodynamic compromise becomes low, and the risk of uh, serious things become low. It's still there, but comes low. But medications would be the first initial um, treatment uh, here. And then, if the heart function changes, and that would be done by an echocardiogram, um, and, that, uh, and that has to be followed regularly, depending on the person's condition, uh, whether that needs to be done yearly or every year or every two years to eject, to evaluate the heart function. So remember an echocardiogram yeah, here in this case, echocardiogram, let me just put it here. So I wrote it here, uh, it's the font is small, echocardiogram to evaluate ejection fraction uh, would be needed. Discuss with your doctor um, about the echocardiogram and about uh, what is uh, needed and what sort of follow-up here is needed. Okay, um, I've got another question I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to put here. And I'm going to share with you in a second. Alex from Bangladesh. I am cool feeling in the left chest and ribs. Sometimes pain and tight feeling. I am in this situation for more than 20 days. I have consulted with a professional uh, doctor. Uh, I'm not, uh, thank you Alex for the question. I'm not really sure about what the, your professional uh, doctor said. Uh, uh, I mean, if you can provide us more information, I'll be able to have more information to share with you and the viewers. So, uh, cool feeling in the chest. You, what we worry about usually in the chest is like either abnormal sensation, chest pain, uh, or uh, uh, heaviness or tightness or pain radiating to the left arm. Uh, this is, these are the general uh, issues that we worry about regarding uh, coronary artery disease. Uh, but there are also other diseases in the heart that can cause chest pain. For example, if you have got pericarditis, inflammation from uh, the lining of the heart, and other situations that can give you pain. But the commonest is coronary artery disease and it's a treatable condition. Most of the time we can restore flow and that's why we worry about it. So coolness usually is not a manifestation that we uh, really worry about uh, a lot, but this is just like the general, general view. This is by no means 
uh, definitive for every single person and uh, people have got different presentations for example heart attacks can come with a, an indigestion feeling or it can come just with shortness of breath or can have no, no symptoms at all in them rare people especially in diabetic people so um, if your doctor uh, thought that you have got a heart disease then things like doing uh, an EKG obviously you would have had an EKG definitely or an ECG to evaluate the heart electrical rhythm uh, your doctor would have also done um, uh, either a chest x-ray possibly an echocardiogram just that's an ultrasound scan of the heart to see what is happening in the coronary arteries and depending on this your doctor might need to consider doing other things like for example doing a stress test uh, a stress tests are um, there in order to tell us whether they have got um, blockages in the heart to see how your heart would relate to stress so if uh, you if you put you for example on a treadmill and i don't know how old you are alex uh, but um, if your heart gets stressed and there is blockages in the coronary artery the stress can be on a treadmill or with medications then that will show on the EKG uh, or on the stress echocardiogram or the stress nuclear test there are different forms of them and that, that would be able to tell us much so I mean you said you saw professional doctor perfect um, because obviously I'm not your doctor I don't have the information I am here to provide you with information um, so I would ask you to follow up with your doctor if this abnormal sensation continues and now that you know the different uh, uh, scenarios that can be like and the presentations and the tests uh, what I said EKG echocardiogram or a stress test asking whether any of these are needed let me write this here uh, I try to see here uh, uh, so ECG chest x-ray echocardiogram ask whether stress so these are the things here um, Alex uh, ECG, chest x-ray, echocardiogram and ask your doctor whether a stress test is needed because that can uh, really help help a lot to evaluate what is going on here so these are the things that I would suggest to you that you discuss with your doctor in order to evaluate your your condition here okay I got another question here share now okay uh, Baraka Ali hello doctor what are the regular preventive testing methods available for a healthy person to protect from sudden heart attack preventative to prevent from a sudden heart attack very good question uh, thank you uh, Barakat Ali for this uh, question. I'm not sure which country you're calling from. Uh, um, I don't think you mentioned it. But thank you for your question. And um, I'll just get to your answer now. So um, there is a million, all of us have to abide by um, healthy lifestyle, healthy diet. Uh, and these are the most important things that I'm going to dwell in in a a few minutes now about uh, what we should do uh, in order to try to prevent heart attack the, um, I just want to re to rephrase the question a bit from what you said uh, uh, unfortunately this is a million dollar question you cannot prevent heart attack you can reduce your risk a heart attack can happen to so many causes um, and even I have got some patients who are super fit, super healthy, and they get a heart attack, and they come to me in clinic, and they say, doctor, I have been doing all the right things. Why did I get a heart attack? 
So uh, I'm telling you this because you can only work on to reduce our risks of getting a heart attack. Uh, and that is by healthy lifestyle. And basically healthy lifestyle, I mean the reduction in the risk factors. For example, no smoking, making sure that our weights are reasonable, we good, good BMI, we don't have high blood pressure. And if we have, then that has to be treated. Our cholesterol level is well controlled and we are eating healthy. And if the cholesterols are not um, controlled and we are in the moderate to high risk group, then medications need to be started to bring these down. These are the general ones, like the general risk factors. There is one risk factor, unfortunately, we do not have any control over it. And that being a family history. If you have got a family history of coronary artery disease and of heart attacks, that's a major predictor for someone or increasing their risk of having heart attack in the uh, future. Um, we don't have control over it. This is just like the lottery of life. We are born with it and therefore we can only control the other risk factors, but we cannot uh, really change that. Healthy diet, the so many diets have been uh, looked into and the most important, the most studied diet is what we call the Mediterranean diet. And the Mediterranean diet is basically uh, vegetables, uh, white meat, chicken and fish. Um, olive oil is part uh, of it as well. You don't need to stick to this 100%, but we should be eating mostly vegetables and white meat and some olive oil uh, in it. This has been the most widely studied diet and has been proven to be um, uh, important in reducing the risk of heart attacks, uh, etc. Other things are like, for example, like exercise, adapting a lot health lifestyle. You need to be like exercising like about 150 minutes or so in a week, basically brisk walking etc it doesn't need to be much like half an hour for five days a week just uh, any any form of uh, circulatory um, uh, exercise is quite good so to, su to summarize modify all the risk factors uh, a healthy diet and make sure that um, uh, keeping our weights and circulation fit. So these are the most important things. As I said, we can reduce our risk significantly. There is no way we can prevent it because this is a million dollar question uh, that nobody really can answer. We can only reduce it, uh, try to protect ourselves, but we cannot 100% say that we uh, n took away uh, the factors that cause heart attack. We can only reduce the risk rather than the heart uh, saying that we prevent heart attack. Okay, so now I will just uh, talk a bit about, continue talking about uh, atrial fibrillation, which I started with uh, um, initially, and then uh, just to get more, give the audience more information about it. So we spoke about atrial fibrillation, that it is while we talk about it, the complications, it can cause most important stroke, uh, it can lead to heart attack, but most co not, unco not commonly, but strokes definitely is a major risk factor, dementia is a long term, the reduced long longevity, heart failure, because the heart is working uh, too, too hard. Uh, let me see here. Okay, so how does it uh, present? So. It can be completely asymptomatic atrial fibrillation uh, and that's it can be subclinical. So you might be going to measure your blood pressure and your blood pressure machine might tell you basically that your heart is irregular and that with irregularity uh, it's um, you have we have obviously do more tests and an EKG and that will show that you are in atrial fibrillation and that brings the point back that we have to do regular checks for ourselves so we cannot be um, not looking after our health or not checking ourselves regularly because certain diseases can only be found 
when you are doing routine checks, not because you have got symptoms uh, for it uh, or about it. So some disease can just manifest with no symptoms at all. And that's why we need to have regular checkups here. Uh, people who have got mitral valve disease, this is one of the major risk factors for atrial fibrillation, especially in um, developing countries. And the reason being that people get rheumatic heart disease, it's a very common disease, well, fairly common cause for atrial fibrillation, I would say. So a uh, mitral valve disease leading to leaky valves or um, or a uh, stenosed valve can be an issue. Also mitral valve disease can happen in heart failure when the ring that holds the mitral valve starts to dilate and then you get leaky mitral valves and that can cause backflow to the left atrium and subsequently that will lead to atrial fibrillation. So mitral valve disease is very important and this group of uh, atrial fibrillation call it valvular atrial fibrillation. So here is the diagram of the mitral valve between the left ventricle and the right uh, atrium, uh, and sorry, and the, and the left atrium. And if it's leaky or stenosed, then we can get issues leading to atrial fibrillation. The problem, as I said, when you get atrial fibrillation, you develop a clot, and that's what we call a transosophageal echo. And you can see clearly here on like the middle to the to, uh, when there is an arrow. Uh, you can see that there is um, a clot and this clot is what we worry about that it dislodges and it can go to different parts of the body and it can give rise to uh, either a stroke uh, or blocking to some major circulation including sometimes it can go to the heart and give rise to acute uh, heart attack. This is just another uh, view. That's how the clot looks like in the echocardiogram. And that's what we worry about. And that's why we treat these patients with atrial fibrillation with blood thinners. Blood thinners uh, are very important in this condition. Uh, sometimes uh, people used to say the atrial fibrillation, we don't have a cause for it. And we used to call it like lone atrial fibrillation. This is a uh, term has been abandoned and don't we don't usually use it anymore because we now know, have got much more information about atrial fibrillation that we do not really um, cause it alone. And also when you label it as lone atrial fibrillation, you are uh, automatically classifying it as a low risk disease, which it's not. It's a very serious disease and it's not a low risk disease by any means. Now, the symptoms that we get for atrial fibrillation um, are different. Sometimes no symptoms at all. As I said, discovered on routine ECG or routine EKG. Um, Sometimes when you measure your blood pressure, the machine tells you that your heart is irregular. And currently with the advance in technology, uh, people are wearing smart watches and then tell them what your heart is uh, being is irregular. And that is one of the main um, causes that uh, people really f go and visit their doctor because it is some, their watch telling them that there is something abnormal and that's why they go and have it checked and it can be atrial fib fib fibrillation. Uh, so also other symptoms can be palpitations, uh, a fast heart rate, fatigue, weakness, dizziness you might be all of a sudden you start to have all, some of these symptoms here and it can be just simply due to the atrial fibrillation and so uh, which is a very it's indication for a very serious underlying condition and that's why we need to go and have this checked uh, and uh, uh, and uh, and treat it so severe symptoms sometimes you can get severe shortness of breath at rest, angina, uh, pre-syncope, syncope, and clots, and as I mentioned, heart failure, because our hearts are not designed uh, to have to be working so fast all the time. So uh, if you are, your heart is working as if it is running 
a marathon all the time, the heart is going to get weak and you're going to get into heart failure. And that's why you need to get this uh, treated and checked so that we don't, so that we prevent heart failure before it, they occur. Complications, I spoke about the complications um, here, so I'm not going to go uh, back on them here again. And that's how I start my presentation because the complications are very um, important um, here in this uh, patient pop population. So um, this is an outline of atrial fibrillation and I'll be talking about it more in the future, uh, about uh, how we treat it and how we diagnose it. Um, I think this, it's, it's a very important disease that all of us will need to be aware of and we need to, um, if we get uh, any symptoms that relate to fast heart rate or our watch tell us that it's irregular or heart rate is irregular, we need to get treated. It's not like a simple thing, I'm just feeling palpitations and that's one of the main reasons when anyone complains to us with palpitations we need to investigate thoroughly. Atrial fibrillation might be one of the main causes here and that's why we have to go and get checked and treated. I'm just really trying to raise the awareness of this condition because it's a very important condition and, it can, and diagnosing it and treating it early can be easy when it's advanced a significant disease might have set into the heart and therefore it will not um, be easy to treat when it's advanced after significant damage has, have to, to, has occurred to the heart. So I will leave it uh, at this point here if there are no further questions from the audience. I don't, I don't see any further questions here. So thank you everyone for uh, tuning in for this uh, session for, uh, of uh, questions and answers. If you have got any questions at any time, uh, please you can shoot them to me in the links. And I plan to do these sessions uh, once every month or so in order to uh, in order to uh, give information to my audience and anyone who needs help regarding uh, information regarding his or her heart disease. And if someone wants to follow up with what I said, uh, please uh, feel free to log in into these sessions um, whenever I post them. With that being said, uh, Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day, uh, wherever you are in the world, and uh, talk to you soon. Thank you.